I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Jonah. We're going to spend one last Sunday in this little small uh, Old Testament book. Uh, just five messages, really, is all that we've, uh, that we've done to cover this book. But what a book it's been. And what a great lesson for us about our God being a God of the second chance. And he is the God of the second chance. I don't know where you've gone. I don't know how far you've run. I don't know how much you've rebelled against whatever God has told you to do in your life, but I'm here to tell you that if God can use people like Jonah, he can use people like you. And God, is, God specializes in renewed opportunities to serve him. Uh, you might be in the church service this morning and think, well, you just don't know how far I've gone. Uh, you just don't know uh, how rebellious I've been. It really doesn't make a difference. If you're breathing, there's hope for you. And that hope is not because you're good. That hope is because he is good. And we're going to learn one final lesson today uh, from the book of Jonah. It's kind of a hard lesson to hear because you would think that Jonah chapters 1, 2, and 3 encapsulate the book. I mean, chapter 1, Jonah gets this message from God. He runs. Chapter 2, God puts him back on course via the whale, right? Chapter number 3, Jonah is given a second chance. He preaches the message he should have preached in chapter 1. God blesses the preaching of that message. And multitudes, like the entire city, repents. And God has mercy on the city. That sounds like the whole story. Jonah didn't go. Jonah did go. And God blessed. That should be the entire story of the book of Jonah. But it's not. Really, chapter number four stands as an epilogue to the story because in chapter four, we have Jonah's reaction to all of what God did. Now, you'd think that Jonah had learned his lesson. You would think that the Jonah that was put back on the right track, the Jonah that finally obeyed the Lord given that second opportunity, would be very glad that even though he had rebelled the first time, on that second chance, he had obeyed and God had blessed. You would think that would be a good thing. But it wasn't a good thing. And what we find is that while Jonah went through the motions of obedience on the outside, on the inside, he is still struggling with a stubborn heart. And I wonder sometimes if that's not me. I wonder sometimes if that's not you. That we go through the motions of repentance and we go through the motions of doing what's right. But on the inside, there's been no real heart change. And that's what's happening in Jonah's life. Matter of fact, the anger that we see in Jonah in chapter 4 reveals a much deeper problem. A much deeper problem that Jonah has. Because he's not just angry about life. He's not just angry about circumstances. He's angry against the Lord. The anger that Jonah has in Jonah chapter 4 is an anger against God. I tried to look this week at a couple instances in the Bible where people actually expressed anger against God. I thought about Cain. There in Genesis chapter 4, how Cain was angry against God. Remember, God had received an offering from Abel, had blessed that offering, had honored that offering of Abel, but, but Cain's offering God would not, uh, would not honor because Cain was not bringing the right kind of offering. But remember what God said? Uh, Cain, why are you mad? Why are you mad? I'll give you another opportunity. I'll give you a second chance. I'll provide you even the offering that you can give to me. But Cain never got over it. God, I want you to accept me on my terms. I don't want to be accepted on your terms. I want you to accept me on my terms. He got mad at God. Maybe that's one of the reasons you're mad at God. Maybe you're watching online today. Maybe that's one of the reasons you're mad at God. I'm mad because God won't accept me as I am. Now, God doesn't accept us who we are. We're accepted only in Christ. That's why repentance and faith in Christ is absolutely imperative. But Cain, Cain got mad at God. Not only did Cain become angry with the Lord, but I think about David. Remember when David had unified the kingdom and David had relocated the capital to Jerusalem and David was intent upon bringing the ark of God, which had now been in Abimelech's home all those many years. I want to bring the ark of God home. I want to bring the ark of God to the place of God. That's what I want to do, the city of God. And remember when the ark of God was being transported on that brand new shiny cart 
And Uzzah was one of the ones that was driving that cart, and the cart became unsteady, and Uzzah reached back and, and studied the ark of God. You would think ostensibly that was a good thing to do. But that was not the prescribed way by which the ark of God should have been carried. God had a much different plan, and they thought that their plan was better than God's plan, and God actually struck Uzzah dead. And David got mad. And David got mad. God, you're unfair. God, you're petty. I'm trying to serve you, and you're judging for the most arbitrary things. Maybe that's the way you feel today. Maybe you feel like, hey, my heart's right with God, and I'm trying to serve God, and it just seems like the most petty and arbitrary things are happening in my life. God's not fair. I'm angry. That was David. That was Cain. I thought about Jeremiah. One of the most depressing chapters in Jeremiah is Jeremiah chapter 20, if you've ever read it. Nothing seems to be going Jeremiah's way. It seems that Jeremiah's made some predictions about what God's going to do. It just seems like evil is, uh, is, is winning and, and good is being trampled underfoot. It just seems as if Jeremiah's messages are meaningless. And finally, Jeremiah is so upset with the Lord that Jeremiah says, God, you deceived me. God, you deceived me. You told me to preach one message. You told me to do one thing, and it's just not working out. God, you lied to me. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to serve you anymore. I'm done. You have not met up to my expectations. I'm done. And of course, you know the passage, how that God's word burned in Jeremiah, and he could not stay, and finally he got back to preaching because God, what God was doing in him. See, the point is this. God doesn't want to just work through you. God wants to work in you. You ever wonder why God sent Jonah to Nineveh? I mean, I'm sure there were other prophets that would have obeyed much more readily. I'm sure there were other prophets that didn't have as much of an issue about going to Nineveh as Jonah did. So, so why would God choose a man who hated Ninevites? Why would God choose somebody who loathed going in that direction? Why would God choose Jonah? Because God is concerned not only uh, with using your life and doing things through you, but God wants to do things in you. And God was concerned about not only reaching Nineveh, but God was concerned about reaching Jonah. And we have to keep that in mind. Otherwise, Christianity just becomes a series of transactions, and I'm just a widget. I'm just a tool that God uses, and, and God, God, God is limited unless he has me. No, God's not limited. God, God can preach the gospel and the stars if he wants to. God doesn't need me any more than he needs you, but God wants to use me, and he wants to use you because he loves you, and he wants to share his heart with you. And Jonah chapter 4, as an epilogue, really is the thrust of the story. God has reached the Ninevites, but now God is reaching deeper still to reach Jonah. But Jonah was, was angry against God. I don't see Cain and Jonah. I don't see David and Jonah. I don't see even Jeremiah and Jonah. They're angry for different reasons. You know who I see in Jonah? I see another man in the Bible who is angry with the father. I see the elder brother in Jonah. That's who I see. Why would you be good to this one? Why would you be good to him? He's wasted his life. There's nothing good about him. Why would you kill for him, the fatted lamb? What about me? What about me? I'm the faithful one. I'm your child. I'm the... That's Jonah. Jonah is the elder brother that has a beef with the father's love for somebody that doesn't deserve the father's love. Lord, I deserve, I deserve... Or they don't deserve, and you've been good to people that don't deserve. That's where Jonah is struggling. So I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Why? Why are you angry with God? Father, I pray that you bless the short message this morning. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come out on a holiday weekend. So many other places we could have been, so many other plans we could have made, but Lord, this group has said, we want to prioritize you, your word. And Lord, I thank you for that. I pray that you'd bless each one that's watching. 
Uh, online, I pray that you bless each one that's here in this room, those that are serving around property. Lord, I pray that you'd bless in a special way. Use uh, this time together among your people. Use this time together around your word to make a profound difference in our lives. Help us to see ourselves in a way that we can only through your word. Oh God, do a work in, in all of our lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look at two big thoughts in Jonah chapter 4. It's only 11 verses long. We'll get through all 11 verses. In verses 1 through 4, I, I want us to see, really really just 1 through 3, I want us to see Jonah's anger. And as we look at Jonah's anger, I, I want us to maybe consider our own anger. The reasons why perhaps you and I become angry with the Lord. Uh, reasons perhaps that you and I uh, harbor some bitterness in our soul. A look at Jonah's story and then superimpose your own story on top of that. And so Jonah's anger, I want to see that. And then secondly, this morning, toward the end of the message, I want to talk about God's answer. Now, God had an answer for Jonah that Jonah didn't really see. And so God had to expand that answer and give him a visual lesson so that Jonah could see perhaps what he should have been able to see but couldn't. And so not only Jonah's anger we'll consider this morning, but then God's answer. How, how does God answer our anger problem? How does God help us to see from his perspective? That's what wisdom is, by the way. Wisdom is seeing things from God's perspective, and God longs for us to see things the way that he sees things. And if we lack wisdom, we can ask a God that giveth to all men liberally, and if it not, he shall give us wisdom. So this morning, even as I'm preaching out loud, why don't you pray silently in your heart, Lord, help me to see my life from your vantage point. Because that's what God's doing here for Jonah in Jonah chapter 4. So Jonah's anger. Look at it, please, in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. Jonah's anger. The Bible says, and it, but it displeased Jonah. What did? The revival. What did? The, the turning to God by the Ninevites. It displeased Jonah. See, I want you to think about this now. Jonah preached the shortest recorded message in the Bible. The shortest, and listen, I'm not going to break his record. I'm telling you that right now, okay? Five words long in the Hebrew language. He preached a five-word message, and yet I don't think you can find a bigger revival in the Bible. Maybe there's a correlation there, right? Shorter messages, bigger revival. I don't know. But five words, and then huge revival, insofar that the entire city repented at the word of Jonah. You talk about God's blessing. I mean, you taught that was amazing, and yet the Bible says in contrast to that good report, verse number one of chapter four, but, that's a word of contrast, but it displeased jo Jonah. That seems irrational. That Jonah, the preacher, would be displeased. But not only is he displeased, watch what it says, uh, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Well, it's not just a displeasure, it's an exceeding displeasure, but the verse is not done. Look at the end of verse one. And he was angry, but not just angry. He was very angry. I think the Lord wants us to be very clear about what Jonah's attitude was. Man, he was having a bad time. He was displeased, exceedingly angry, very angry. I see, first of all, this morning, a description of his anger displeased exceedingly, very angry. But not only do I see a description of his anger, notice the reason. Notice the reason for his anger. We find that in verse number two, where the Bible says, and he prayed unto the Lord. Now, ostensibly, that's a good thing to do, right? Pray to the Lord. I'm, I'm mad about something. I, I don't think something's fair in my life. I, uh, things didn't go the way I thought that they should go. I, I'm taking moral umbrage with the circumstances unfolding the way they are. I'm going to go to God about that. God? No, is, is it wrong to go to the Lord? Of course not. I think going to the Lord is a good thing. And, and so Jonah goes to the Lord, much like Martha, who was coming about much serving, went to the Lord. Lord, don't you, don't you care? That my sister has left me to serve alone? I mean, uh, ostensibly she did the right thing going to the Lord, but her prayer revealed her selfishness. And in Jonah chapter 4, his prayer reveals his selfishness. Look at what he says in verse number 2. 
He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? I find that staggering. Lord, didn't I tell you? That's what he's saying. So apparently, when God had called Jonah the first time, Jonah's protestation against the Lord was, Lord, I know it's going to happen. I'm going to go there, and you're going to have mercy on those God rejectors, and you shouldn't have mercy on them. You should judge them. Do you know how violent they are, Lord? I told you. Lord, I told you this is why I didn't go in the first place, and then I came here, and exactly what I predicted came true. But it sounds like Jonah's suffering from role reversal. Sounds like Jonah has put himself in God's seat and he's putting God in front of him to explain his rationale to Jonah. Do we do that sometimes? Sometimes we go to the Lord with our demands and we go to the Lord with our rationale. We say, Lord, uh, this didn't work out the way I thought it should. Lord, if you only knew what I knew, if you only followed what I said, if my word were more important to you, I said, I said. But not only do I see I said in verse number two, look at what the Bible goes on to say. Oh, Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? I said, therefore, I fled. I said, I fled. I said, and that's why I ran. I fled. I fled before unto Tarshish. Remember, Tarshish was as far as a person could go in the then known world. I mean, if you were going to get on a boat and go as far to the west as you possibly could, you will go to Tarshish. I mean, that's all the way through the Strait of Gibraltar. I mean, there's the Atlantic Ocean. That's the edge of the world back in those days. I mean, Jonah said, God, that's why I ran. I ran as far and as fast as I could from you because I didn't want this to happen. And I told you this was going to happen. I said, I fled. Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew. I dread. I dread, and well, here was my dread, here was my fear. My fear was that I would go and preach this message of judgment. I would go and tell them about the impending doom, but I just know you too well, God. And I just know that when they got uh, scared about your impending judgment, now I just knew that you would give them a time frame, and I just knew that if they repented, you would have compassion on them, and I did not want you to have compassion on them. I said, I fled, I dread, it all happened. Matter of fact, watch what he says at the end of verse 2. He said, "I I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful, Now, Jonah is like putting this back in God's face, like he shouldn't be this way. Yeah, Lord, I know how you are. You're just too loving. That's what you are. You're too slow to anger. That's it. Now, that's your problem. I'm not being sacrilegious. This is what Jonah's saying. I knew that you were gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. I, I knew that, that you, you could be persuaded by the response of these people. I knew that. And how did Jonah know, know that? H- how did Jonah know that that was God's character? Well, Jonah knew that because the word of God had taught with, in no uncertain terms that that is God's character. As a matter of fact, the, the, the Bible is quoting in John four, or Jonah 4 and verse 2, the Bible is actually quoting a passage back from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 34, where Moses has come back to God and, and Moses has said, Lord, I know your people I know your people were, were, were rebelling there and I know they built, they, they constructed that, that golden calf and I know you're really angry, but Lord, they're your people and they, they stand for your name and, and don't kill them. And God said, oh, I'm not going to kill them. God said, because I'm a merciful God and I'm a gracious God and I'm slow to anger and I can be persuaded. You know, you know what God told Moses God told Moses what Jonah just told God. And what did God do? God did have mercy on the people of God that had rebelled against him. And God did have mercy on the people of God that had constructed that that golden calf. And God did have mercy. God did give them a second chance. In other words, Jonah's like, God, I'm all for you giving a second chance to people I like. But Lord, I reserve the right to tell you not to give a second chance to people that I don't like. 
Lord, you love everybody. That's your problem. But I don't. So, Lord, I want you to be good to the people that I want you to be good to. And when you're not good to the people that I want you to be good to, then you're not a good God. Boy, this sounds like Jonah's got some real issues. No, actually, it sounds like I've got some real issues. Because although I would not say this out loud, I think this is true of all of us, isn't it? And how is it that we can, with one fell mental swoop, just disregard whole categories of people? As if they're less deserving. As if they don't deserve, as if, as if, and deserving is not the right word, as if, as if they're, they're less accessible to God's mercy. Or, or they, they don't, and that's, that's what Jonah's doing here. With one fell mental swoop, he's just saying, God, there are certain people that just don't, I don't want you to be good. I don't want them to be the recipient of, I don't. God reiterated this, by the way, in the Bible. Remember the book of Numbers when the 10 spies came back with an evil report and only two of the 10 spies came back with a, 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 a good report. Remember Joshua and Caleb and the people of God decided to rebel against the word of God. We're not going to go into the promised land and we're not going to live by faith and we're going to say no to God. And Remember, God kept that generation alive and quoted this verse and said, now I'm a God that's slow to anger and I'm gracious and I'm kind and I give second chances. And, and what Jonah is saying, God, uh, we want the second chance when it's uh, our people. We want the second of chance when it's, when, it's, when it's our people a second time. And matter of fact, Psalm 78 reiterates both those verses again. In other words, when it's me, I want a second chance. But when it's somebody else, God kill them. When it's somebody that stole someone else's sheep, kill them. When it was me that stole someone else's wife, God, I want mercy. Wasn't that David's attitude? Isn't it amazing how we maximize the sins of other people and minimize our own? That's where Jonah's at. And so we see the description of his anger. He's displeased exceedingly. He's very angry. We see the reason for his anger. We see the expression of his anger. This is what I said. This is why I fled. This is what I dread. God, you're wrong, I'm right. He's saying this directly to the Lord. What's the source? What's the source of his anger? Because really this goes down to a heart level issue, doesn't it? You ever see somebody that responds in an angry way and you're like, where did that come from? Where did that come from? I mean, they just went off. Where did that come from? Normally, it's not the issue. Normally, the issue is not the issue. Normally, the issue is something much deeper than the issue. And the issue with Jonah is something much deeper than that. Is Jonah really mad at God? No, what disappoints Jonah is not the mercy of God. What disappoints Jonah is not the goodness of God or the grace. No, he's all for those things when they work out for him. What Jonah's disappointed about is God didn't do what he wanted God to do. That's the point. What, what bothers Jonah is Jonah wants his way. Look, look at verse number three. Therefore, now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. Jonah knew better than to know he could commit suicide because he tried that once and God said, uh uh, now I'm going to have a whale swallow you up. Now Jonah's got to ask permission, Lord, just, to, just for his life to end. <laughs> so he said, Lord, take my life from me. Now watch it, verse number three, for it's better for me. Have you seen that before as you've read Jonah? It's better for me. It's better for me that I die than to live. Better for me. That's Jonah's problem. That's the source of his anger. The source of his anger is Jonah lives for himself. Jonah wants what Jonah wants. And when God's plan is approved by Jonah's stamp, then everything's good. Then it's a good God. Then God's right. Then God's smart. Then God's wise. That's, that's acceptable. When, but when God's plan doesn't fit with my plan, then don't oh, just kill me, Lord. You're not doing it right. Why, I told you. I said, I ran. This is why. Just kill me. I'm going to take my ball and my bat. And I'm going to go home. Because, Lord, the rules to this game are my rules. 
not your rules. Are you angry? Because God's not playing by your rules. The things you asked him to do, he didn't do. The life that you wanted to have, it's not unfolded that way. He's not been good to the people you wanted to be good to and the people you didn't want him to be good to, he's been good to them. And Lord, your sense of justice is a little bit skewed. Lord, if you'd just consult with me a little bit more, then maybe we... I mean, Jonah is angry. But not only do I see, first of all this morning, Jonah's anger, but watch with me lastly this morning, God's answer. Would you look at verse number four? Verses four through 11 really deal with the way by which God answered Jonah. Jonah's angry. That's clear. He's very angry. He's exceedingly displeased. We, we got that down. People don't say these things to God without really being up in a tizzy. But, but watch how God graciously answers Jonah. Verse number four. Then said the Lord. Here's the Lord's response. Now, if I were God, and I had all the power in the universe, and I could just do the lightning bolt thing, you know, like that and that, and, you know, I mean, I think that if some little peon named Jonah told me I was wrong and he was right, I would show him. Don't make me come back there. Right? But watch the grace of God to Jonah. Verse number four. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? That, that's God's only response initially. Jonah, um, do you, are you justified to be angry right now? I, I'm just asking. Jo, Jonah, is it okay for you to talk to me this way? Hmm? You know what God wants in my life and in your life? He wants you to come to conclusions. See, God could have said, Jonah, you're wrong. Jonah, you're, you Jonah, that's, Jonah, shut your mouth. Who do you think you, he could have said all that, and rightfully. But he said none of that. Jonah, let me ask you a question. Is it, is it right for you to be angry right now? You know what questions do? Questions cause us, they prick our conscience. You have to look inward. A question forces you to look inward. Am I justified to be anger? angry? Is it right for me to say these things to God? God wants you to see things about you that he sees that you haven't seen yet. That's what wisdom is, by the way. God wants you to see things about you that he sees that you can't see yet. I want you to think about this. So I see in God's answer, first of all, he called for Jonah to reflect. The question's rhetorical, but Jonah still needed to answer it. Questions are meant to stir contemplation and inspection, introspection. He didn't lecture Jonah. It wasn't an argument about who's right and who's wrong. Now, clearly, God is right, but this was not a matter of me having the upper hand. This is a matter of Jonah. I want you to see what I see about you. Hey, Jonah, think about it. Are you really right to be angry right now? Watch what Jonah does, verse number five. So Jonah went out of the city. He sat on the east side of the city. That, that's very interesting to me because Nineveh was east of, of Galilee, Gat Heifer, where, where Jonah was from, and he went all the way to the other side of the city. He went beyond the city. Huge city. We talked about that. Three days' journey just to get through that city. He gets to the other side. He sits, I think, with a, a panoramic view of the city. And, and watch what happens in verse number five. He, he went and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth. A little lean-to, if you will. He sat under it in the shadow. If you've ever been in the Middle East and uh, experienced the, the sun in the Middle East, it is absolutely punishing. Uh, you can be in the shade. It'll be 25 degrees cooler in the shade. You do anything you can to find shade in the Middle East. So he builds this booth. It's meeting the need at least for a moment. The Bible says that he sat under in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. You know, I, I believe what Jonah was doing was God was saying, Jonah, Jonah, Lord, why did you? Well, you're going to forgive them. You're going to give them a second chance. And I knew it. I saw it. I said it. I fled. I, I feared this. 
And God said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, Jonah. Are, are you right to be angry? And maybe Jonah was thinking, oh, maybe I've, maybe I've misjudged God. Maybe he is going to judge them. Maybe I've just not waited long enough. So he goes over, makes his little lean-to, okay, sits there to see what's going to happen. Maybe the reason God asked me that question is because he's going to do something, and I just kind of preempted all this, and let's see. So he sits there in the shadow of that booth. And the Bible says in verse number seven, six, and the Lord prepared a gourd. Isn't that interesting? All throughout the book of Jonah, God's preparing things ahead of Jonah. It's like he does in your life, by the way, preparing things ahead of you. So he prepared a, 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 a wind, a, a storm. He prepared a great fish. He prepared a gourd. He prepares a worm. He prepares a wind. In this path, God's always ahead. He's always ahead. He's preparing. So he prepares a gourd, like a fast-growing vine. And he, he made it to come up over Jonah. Not only did he, did he prepare this gourd, but it grew up in a day. I'd like to have been there for that. Uh, Wanda leaves, and I had to take care of the plants. And don't tell her this. She, she, honey, don't listen right now. But, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I kill the plants. I have to go out and buy new plants and pretend that they were there when I'm just telling you. <laughs> Boy, it feels good to finally just admit that. The Lord God prepared a gourd. He made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head. God gave Jonah air conditioning. God gave Jonah air conditioning to deliver him from his grief. Watch this. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. I mean, that, that cheered him up. The only place in the whole book you read about Jonah being happy. I got some AC. This is awesome. This is great. He's loving the gourd. God is loving him, and he just threw a fit against God. He just accused God. He just stomped out on God. It's the toddler that, that, that has screamed at mom and dad, and the parent came, would you like some ice cream? <laughs> That's Jonah right now. Look at verse number seven. But God prepared a worm. Hmm. When? When the morning rose, so he had one day of AC. It worked for his AC, worked for one day. And when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. Verse number eight, and it came to pass when the sun did arise, again now, the third time in three verses, God prepared. God prepared a vehement east wind. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah, so now he has no shade. And now the, the wind is, is, is wafting that heat on Jonah in waves. It's so bad, the Bible says, that he fainted. Sunstroke. He just passes, passes out in the afternoon sun. And he wished in himself to die. And he said, huh, let's see if Jonah learned his lesson with God's, ob God's object lesson. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. So we see a reiteration of Jonah's problem, don't we? The source of Jonah's anger. What's better for me? What's better for me? When I have air conditioning, life is good. When God's good to people I hate, life is bad. When the air conditioner breaks, God's bad. When God does everything the way I want it to be done, God's good. Why? Because my whole view of life is what is better for me? What is better for me? What accrues to my creature comforts? But when that happens, God's good. You say, well, Pastor Skelly, I mean, that's pretty selfish. Yeah, that's pretty American. That's pretty 21st century. That's pretty us. And watch what the Lord says here. And now we're done. Verse number nine. So he called for Jonah to reflect. He, he put Jonah's anger into proper context. And now he exposes Jonah's anger for what it really is. So watch how God exposes Jonah. Watch how God exposes us. Would you look at it? Verse number nine. God said to Jonah, dost thou well to be angry? When God repeats questions in your life, it's because he knows that you don't have the right answer yet. 
This is not like some failed educational system where we can just take a test, fail it, and move on. Now, God never does that. He's the, he's the master teacher. When he gives us a test and we fail it, he gives us the same test. So with the Lord, we get stuck in Algebra 1 for our entire lives. So God said, Jonah, are you well to be angry? And Jonah doesn't even answer. He stomps out to the east side of the city to wait. And then God does the gourd thing and the worm thing and the wind thing. And Jonah faints. And then he comes back to Jonah and says, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about that gourd? Is it right for you to, you were angry about the people that I saved. God, are you angry that I, you know, I, you know, I can kill things too. Like I didn't kill the people and you were mad about that. But I, but I killed the plant that I made. I make people and I make plants. And I saved the people, but I, I didn't kill the plant. I, but I killed the plant. Are you mad about that? Is that, is that are, are you righteous in your indignation? And watch what Jonah says. You have to hand it to Jonah. I mean, he was rebellious, but he was honest about his rebellion. Look at verse number nine. And he said, verse nine, he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Yes, you got that right. I'm mad. I am ripping mad. I'm hot. Yeah, he was hot. He was hot. Then said the Lord, here's the lesson for you, for me. Thou hast had pity on the gourd. All right, so let's, let's, let's look at this now from this perspective, Jonah. You have had compassion on a plant. We live in a weird world. You have had compassion on a plant. You care about the, the, the environment more than you care about people. Okay, I have had compassion on people. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care for plants. You want to talk to your plants, have at it, okay? It's a perspective thing. Number two, thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow. So lesson number two, you had nothing to do with this plant's existence. You had compassion on a plant, I have compassion on people. You did nothing to bring this plant into existence. All you did was enjoy it while it lived. Okay? I did everything to bring people into existence. I am the creator. Number three, the plant lasted one day. Do you see that? Neither made us it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. That plant had a shelf life of one year. People live forever. So you take your stand over here, Jonah. Plants that you didn't do a thing to make exist to live or die one day. And I'm over here, Jonah, and I'm saying people whom I made who live eternally. See what God's doing? He's weighing Jonah's better for me with better for thee. Because that's the choice you have to make this morning. Are we going to live a better for me or a better for thee life? Do you know the first requisite of discipleship is deny yourself? If you're looking for the church that's going to tell you that, hey, you know, you're fine. Do what you want to do. Find your best life now. Everything's easy. Everything's good. You know, just health, wealth, and prosperity. Then we're not the church for you. Because we have a nasty little thing that gets in the way with that philosophy. And it's called the Bible. Now, do Christians enjoy health, wealth, and prosperity eternally? Of course they do. Through Christ. But in this world, you shall have tribulation. And so if your estimation of God is going to be your estimation of how God handles circumstances, you're going to have a roller coaster estimation of God. And so God was trying to show Jonah, Jonah, listen, this whole thing is about people. And you don't seem to care about people. Look at the last verse and we'll, we'll read it and we'll be done. Verse 11. So here's the, the application that God makes. 
So should I not spare Nineveh? That great city? Wherein are more than six score, six score 120,000. 120,000 persons, people, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left. So Nineveh was a much bigger city than that, but God's specifically referencing now children, young children. What, like your toddler that doesn't know which shoe goes on which foot. What's his left hand, what's his right hand? I don't know. God says, okay, Jonah, I can see maybe where you would have a problem with me saving these wicked soldiers that have been so cruel. What about all these little children? Now, Jonah, if you can have compassion on a plan, shouldn't I be able, to, as the creator of eternal souls, to have compassion on people? Watch this. From the right hand to the left, and also much cattle. I think he threw that in there to say, you know, and, you know, I, and even, even animals are more important than plants. I mean, Jonah, you have missed it entirely. So I was uh, traveling to Nicaragua. Uh, this must have been seven or eight years ago on a missions trip. The team had already gone to Nicaragua. We took 100 people to Nicaragua. It's an amazing missions trip. And I was going a little bit later. I had, um, I had to go a day late. So I was traveling, and I was flying through Miami. And Miami airport is it's huge. It's a huge airport. So I, I was, my flight coming in was late. But my flight going, my layover that I had to catch was on time. Why is that always the case? I'm not angry. I'm just, I'm just concerned. <laughs> so I, I, I got off my flight, and man, I am running through the airport. Like, I, I, it is the last gate. I'm running, and there's no way I'm going to make it. So I'm running, and I can see the gate agent like down back when I can see farther than the hand in front of my face. And I'm running, and I'm like, wait, wait. I know I look foolish, but I didn't want to lose the flight. So I get there, and sure enough, that gate agent had mercy on me, and I walked in. I was the last person on the plane. And not only was I the last person on the plane, I am sweating profusely, <laughs> and I'm in the last seat on the window on the plane. So I'm walking, so like the walk of shame right now. It's like, why isn't this flight take? Oh, hey, that guy. And I'm like, hey, hey, God bless you, you know, doing the Miss America wave, I'm, you know. So I get to the last seat on the plane and I notice in the last five rows of the plane, everybody has their Zambia T-shirt on. Now it wasn't Zambia, but it was clearly a missions team going to Nicaragua. And I thought, well, Lord, that's why, you know, this is great. This is, this, I'm going to be able to spend the next three hours on this flight, you know, talking about the Lord and talking about missions. And this is great, this, these T-shirts on. So I, I, excuse me, pardon me, I sat down and I said to the young lady next to me, I said, hey, what are, what are you guys doing? I said, I know you have all the same T-shirts. She goes, we're going on a missions trip. I said, great. I started putting on my pastoral language. Praise the Lord. Wonderful, amen. I said, "What, yo? Know, who are you gonna be with?" She said, "Well, we're gonna, we're gonna be working along the the beach." I said, "Oh, beach ministry." Uh, I said, "What are you gonna be doing?" She said, "Oh, we're we're here to uh, to save the baby turtles." <laughs> like the ones on Finding Nemo. She said, well, not really, but, you know, the baby turtles. She said, yeah, what we do is we go down, and, and she told me, I'm telling you, for like the next hour, she's telling me about the money they raised, she told about the, the plight of the turtle, the life cycle of the turtle. I'm just like, I just want a bowl of turtle soup is all I really want, you know. <laughs> I didn't say that to her, though. What are you doing in Nicaragua? Oh, well, we're here to feed people that live in a dump that don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And then we're going to go up to Mount Agalpa and we're going to build some houses and some dormitories for young people that 
feel a call of God upon their life to preach the gospel because, you see, people have a great need because we're lost and we're sinners. There's eternal punishment. It's called hell. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. I began to give the gospel to her, and I couldn't help but think, huh, this is Jonah, and this is God's heart. We all make that decision. This is better for me. This is better for thee. And as Jonah's book closes on Faith Baptist Church, can I just remind you that this book was not about you reaching the world as much as this book was about God reaching you. Boy, if he reaches me, then the world will be reached.